Yeah, good afternoon and salam alaikum. Yeah. This is Dr. Aftar Ramadan Sari, coordinator of this program. Okay, good afternoon to you. Good afternoon. Yeah. We, start I'm thinking we can start. I think the participants are less, but I think they'll join as we go along. Uh, they so are that we can finish by 56. 5 o'clock. 56 participants are registered, ma'am, but usually 46 and 42 around they join. Uh -huh. and I think before 15 minutes, they have left one program which are going on. Oh. Okay. So I think uh, after five ten minutes they will join. So we should start. I think. So. I think we should start. Let's not wait for them. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah, yeah. Dean participants, uh, good afternoon to all of you. Once again, we are here to listen to one of the uh, regular, I will say, the resource person and uh, of ANU HRDC, Dr. Shakila Shamshu, ma'am. Uh, he was a former OSD of New Education Policy 2020 in the Department of Higher Education, Ministry of Education. She has been secretary of the committee to draft national education policy. She was also the nodal officer of flagship government of India, a scheme of national mission on teachers and training, NNT. New initiative of leadership and academic program, which is known as LEAP, L E A P, annual literature program in teaching, ARPIN, and faculty induction program were implemented during her tenure. Uh, dear participants, uh, Shakila Ma'am is a beautiful combination of academic caliber and administrative uh, women. She did PhD in education, law, MA in political science, PG diploma in distance education, from SNDT University, Jamia IGNU, OSD in MHRDC for 14 years. Uh, she launched in 12th plan, Calum, LEAP, on the PMMNT and RP. Up her academic career spanned over 39 years in teaching and academics in the University of Mumbai and IGNU over 14 years in the government of India. She holds PhD, as I told you, and gold medalist, Master of Political Science, PG Diploma in Distance Education and Degree in Law. She has to her credit a number of articles and research papers in international journals of review. Books contribution was involved in the repression of 11th and 12th plan in several government reports on education. She has been a member of various committees of government of India, state governments, UGC, USIEM, Natural Selection Committee for full bright fellowship, etc. After retirement, ma'am has joined Center for Public Policy Research Advisor as, a, as, an, as an advisor coach located at Kochi. This is non profit organization and think tank. Uh, Ma'am, we are pleased to have you for another lecture in this program. Uh, without any delay, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Shakila Samsu, ma'am, to join our this program and deliver your deliberation. This is my word to you, ma'am, for today's topic. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Professor Ansari, and uh, good afternoon to one and all. I think participants will join as we go along, but. I think that the theme that we are covering today is on skill development. And I think this is one of the areas in which a lot of our faculty seem to be quite lost in terms of how to implement it within the four-year undergraduate program. Now, without much, uh, without wanting to really jump directly into the topic, I would be quite happy if a couple of you would share your thoughts maybe on skill development or generally on the national education policy or in terms of any implementation challenges. I think we could take that till about five, uh, 3.45, by which time maybe more participants would also join in. So I'd request uh, Professor Ansari to just coordinate uh, a few participants sharing their thoughts on the national education policy. Can no, we no. have a few of you uh, expressing some of your thoughts on it? We can start at 3.45 sharp so that we can have, I could also get a feel of what you people are actually facing on ground level. 
participant please respond as soon as possible ma'am is asking some query about the nep 2020 and Hero. please feel free to ask either in english or in hindi if you don't feel hesitant about it and please be as free as possible it is just for me to understand what is it that you all are actually having in your mind or what are the challenges that you all are facing okay arpana ma'am arpana singh yes sir yes ma'am uh, yes ma'am uh, ma'am mera ek observation hai main वैसे तो मैम मैं यूनिवर्सिटी डिपार्टमेंट में पीजी डिपार्टमेंट में हूं यूज योर सेल्फ अर्पणा प्लीज यस यस योर मैम योर मैम 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 माय सेल्फ डॉक्टर अर्पणा सिंह आई एम फ्रॉम बीएन मंडल यूनिवर्सिटी मधेपुरा बिहार मैम मैं ये कहना चाह रही हूं कि हम लोगों का तो खैर पीजी डिपार्टमेंट है तो उसमें तो अभी तक ऐसा कुछ बहुत ही मतलब क्या बोलूं ओवरहॉलिंग इस तरीके से नहीं हुआ है लेकिन मैम ग्रेजुएशन जिन हम लोगों के कॉलेजेस में चल रहा है तो वहां से टीचर्स और बच्चे भी मैम बड़ी संख्या में आ रहे हैं और वो बुक्स को लेकर के बार बार मैम कह रहे हैं कि बुक्स नहीं मिल रही हैं हमें बड़ी समस्या हो रही है और चूंकि मैम उनको इंटरनल एग्जाम है या कुछ भी है तो वो मैम बुक्स को लेकर के वो कह रहे हैं तो चूंकि मैम मेरा डायरेक्ट कोई ऐसा हैंड्स ऑन एक्सपीरियंस नहीं है इस मामले को लेकर के लेकिन हम प्राय ही डेली बेसिस पे ये सुनते रहते हैं मैम तो मुझे ये थोड़ा सा बहुत ही पैथेटिक लगता है कि आ, मतलब बच्चे वास्तव में परेशान तो है मैम और टीचर्स भी कह रहे हैं कि नहीं वॉट शुड आई डू फॉर यू आप इंटरनेट से तैयार करो या कुछ भी कुछ सर्टेन टॉपिक्स है तो भाई इंटरनेट पे वो मिल जा रहा है बट मैम इंटरनेट पे हर एक टॉपिक के लिए मतलब स्क्रॉल करना वो मैम आज की डेट में हैबिट तो है ये लेकिन एक बुक बुक के एक तो मतलब एक सहारा रहता ही है मैम तो मैम इस पे आ, मैं आपसे कुछ जानना चाहूंगी मैम सो एक्चुअली वेन यू कम टू हायर एजुकेशन इट इज नॉट लाइक स्कूल एजुकेशन वेर यू है प्रिस्क्राइब टेक्सट बुक बट इट इज वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट और बहुत ही जरूरी है कि फैकल्टी अपने आप से एक लिस्ट ऑफ सजेस्टेड रीडिंग्स तैयार कर ये बहुत जरूरी है क्योंकि ये सजेस्टेड रीडिंग्स अपने खुद के घरों में भी नहीं अवेलेबल होंगे तो भी लाइब्रेरी में डेफिनेटली अवेलेबल होना चाहिए और ये लाइब्रेरी यूसेज में भी वो एंकरेज करेंगे ताकि स्टूडेंट्स दीज डेज स्टार्ट एक्चुअली गोइंग टू द लाइब्रेरी एंड रीडिंग इट अब क्योंकि इंटरनेट अवेलेबल है सम ऑफ दीज आर अवेलेबल इन ऑनलाइन वर्शन एंड दे कैन एक्सेस इट फ्रॉम देयर बट नॉट इन सपोज अ पर्टिकुलर फैकल्टी इज नॉट प्रिपेयरिंग अ लिस्ट ऑफ सजेस्टेड रीडिंग्स देन वॉट विल हैपन इज ये जो छोटे मोटे बुक शॉप निकल के आ जाते हैं जो रेडी रेकनर जैसे गाइड्स बनाते हैं बच्चे उसको रिफर करेंगे और क्वालिटी ऑफ एजुकेशन फिर भी डिटोरिएट हो जाएगी तो प्रिस्क्राइब टेक्स्ट बुक्स तो हम लोग रेकमेंड नहीं करते बिकॉज देर इज अज फॉर्मर सेक्रेटरी है इसको हमारे मिनिस्ट्री के जो बताते थे कि पब्लिशिंग इंडस्ट्री एज फार एज अकेडमी इज कंसर्न इज अ बिग माफिया क्योंकि जो पब्लिशर्स है ये बड़े तरीके से वो मार्केट करते है कि हमारी बुक दूसरे बुक से बेटर है हालांकि वो टेक्स्ट बुक के हिसाब से जो तैयार करते है वो बहुत ही सब स्टैंडर्ड होती है और हायर एजुकेशन टेक्स्ट बुक ओरिएंटेड नहीं होना चाहिए हायर एजुकेशन स्टूडेंट्स मस्ट गेट डिफरेंट पर्सपेक्टिव्स फ्रॉम डिफरेंट ऑथर्स एंड देन व्हाट द टीचर इज टेलिंग इन द क्लास प्लस मे बी एक्टिविटीज इन विच दे पार्टिसिपेट थ्रू ग्रुप डिस्कशन सो इट इज अ कॉम्बिनेशन ऑफ एक्चुअली यूजिंग मल्टीपल पेडोगीज मल्टीपल रीडिंग मेटीरियल एडिशनल रेफरेंस मेटीरियल दैट स्टूडेंट्स कैन रीड कुछ बच्चे ऐसे होते हैं कि दे लाइक टू रीड मोर रेफरेंस मटेरियल्स आल्सो सो द फैकल्टी शुड हैव अ लिस्ट ऑफ ऑल दिस द मिनिमम प्रिस्क्राइब्ड सजेस्टेड रीडिंग्स एडिशनल रेफरेंस रीडिंग लिंक्स टू ऑनलाइन रिसोर्सेस एडिशनल कोर्स मटेरियल दैट कैन बी अवेलेबल थ्रू डिफरेंट वेबसाइट्स ये सब तैयार करते हुए ही टीचर तैयार होना चाहिए देन यू विल नॉट हैव दिस जी neither will the uh, university prescribe textbooks they will only say suggested readings because textbooks are very substandard materials brought out by publishers which are very ordinary books and that is not what higher education is about now come to let us say a student who is saying that chalo mujhe reference material suggested readings ye sab nahi chahiye तो जो मार्केट में अवेलेबल होगा जो भी एक बुक स्टोर में अवेलेबल होगा देर दे विल गेट 
some textbooks which as a faculty as far as possible you should discourage you should not encourage but if someone is saying ki nahi mere paas time nahi hai hum log earn and learn kar rahe hai hum log english background se nahi hai isliye hame bahut dikkat hoti hai hame readings suggested readings ka language bahut uh, high level ki hoti hai hame samajhne mein nahi aati hai then such cases as an exception you can suggest maybe out of making a survey two or three because here what happens is if faculty recommends a book which is in the market he is he or she is recommending a publisher and that is a nexus it is like a doctor prescribing a medicine and then having a nexus with a medical store ki wohi dukan se yahi naam ka medicine le that nexus we should not create and that is not desirable to aap textbook avoid kijiye references suggested readings online resources bataiye but if there are very exceptional cases you can say ki chalo ye do teen publishers hai inke books generally use karte hai so you can try it out and that has got nothing to do with the bearing on the exam or you are writing on an examination and so on ye aap bahut upfront batana chahiye जी मैम मैं समझ रही हूँ मैम आप बिल्कुल सही कह रही हैं आपने जो पब्लिशर और ये जो आ, मतलब नेक्सस आपने जो बताया ये बिल्कुल सही है मैम ये बहुत बड़ी समस्या है और आ, आ, लेकिन मैम प्रॉब्लम क्या है कि यहाँ पे लाइब्रेरी वगैरह भी उतनी रिच नहीं है आ, बट वो चाहे अनचाहे हम लोग इनकरेज करें या डिस्करेज करें सिर्फ एक ही एक ही माध्यम मैम बचता है वो ऑनलाइन रिसोर्सेज का तो स्टूडेंट्स आर यूजिंग इट तो वही हो रहा है मैम बाकी लाइब्रेरीज वगैरह की तो कंडीशन बहुत ही बेकार है मैम हम लोगों को भी बहुत समस्या होती है वो मतलब ऑनलाइन ही हम लोग भी बुक्स वगैरह मंगाते हैं नहीं तो यहाँ पे मैम ये बहुत ही अब इसको मैं ये कह सकती हूँ जोग्राफी वाइज भले ही ये बहुत रिमोट एरिया ना हो लेकिन फिर भी मैम यहाँ पे कंडीशन बहुत पैथेटिक है बट वही है कि भाई अब हम लोग यहाँ पे है तो कर रहे हैं मैम जैसे नेशनल डिजिटल लाइब्रेरी अगर आप ऑनलाइन ही यूज कर रहे हैं then we have a huge collection of materials stored on the national digital library that we have yes ma'am we got to know about yes. this uh, during yes. our orientation program yes, yes ma'am yes. yes. you must use yes. only the ndl libraries and inflibnet and so on where you get you know good journals good mag, um, publications and access to a lot of even phd literature that has been pre prepared where some students may be able to really benefit from it and in multiple languages also ye nahi hai ki wo sirf english ko hi limited hai so ndl ka aap agar use recommend karenge to aap as a faculty you should start using the ndl yourself and for your subject identify what are the resources available so that you can give very specific hyperlinks to the students ki ye aap on ndl mein jaiye aur ye wale book refer kijiye so that that will be helpful to the students rather than students google mein ja ke type karte hue kuch keywords dalenge aur kuch aur material nikal ke aa jayenge uske behtar to ye hoga ki aap specific bataiye ki ndl mein ye dekhe ye journal pad sakte hai usme ye article aaya hua hai ya ye publication hai isme ye book mein aap padhiye this can be the way to go about it when you say that library resources are very limited uh, in the colleges Thank you, ma'am. We'll surely do that. Yeah. Anyone else? Ritesh sir, we'll ask Ritesh. Ritesh Kumar. Ritesh Kumar sir. Chandrasekhar sir. Okay, I think Professor Ansari. I'll take my session and then. और अगर स्किल डेवलपमेंट के ऊपर इंटरेक्शन फैकल्टी चाहते हैं तो देन वी कैन गो इन टू दैट सो लेट अस गो इन टू द टॉपिक ऑफ स्किल डेवलपमेंट अंडर द नेशनल एजुकेशन पॉलिसी ये कौन सा दिन चल रहा है प्रोफेसर अंसारी हाउ मेनी डेज मोर दे हैव हैव दे हैड टू डेज आर देयर लेफ्ट ओनली टू डेज आर लेफ्ट ओके सो आई बिलीव अ बल्क ऑफ द सेशंस वुड हैव कवर्ड मेनी ऑफ द एस्पेक्ट्स ऑफ the national education policy such as holistic and multidisciplinary education has also covered possibly research and innovation um, student diversity internationalization that is higher education and society and many such themes and i am not too sure <coughs> whether any one of you have also had 
the opportunity to understand the national education policy in terms of a larger perspective of education policy making. That I think as educators, uh, irrespective of which discipline you teach or which theme of NEP you are attending, you must understand the larger picture of a policy that happens. So in putting two or three very fundamental uh, aspects before you, one is that policies come out in all sectors of business that the government deals with. So here we are talking about education. You have sectors like health, you have uh, industrial policies, you have trade policies, you have defense policies. All of these are policies that are brought out from time to time. But what you regularly see is that, or commonly see is that, that policies come out at certain regular intervals. And that is because policies are always responding to certain changes that happen within the society or within the economy. Now, this particular policy also, as a policy which came out after 1986, which was partially modified in 1992, is a good long period of about nearly three decades, more than three decades, and this that this policy has come out. So something has changed in between that intervening period that has called for the need to relook at education and the way education is transacted. That is what we need to appreciate and understand. Because most of the time, <clears throat> teachers or as faculty, whether we are school teachers or whether we are university teachers or whether we teach undergraduate students or PG students, irrespective of all that, the policy can only be translated if teachers are convinced that this is imperative to be done. That is, the conviction has to come from within. And that is why it is very, very important that we understand the <clears throat> spirit behind the policy. And this is precisely what I would like to do in a couple of minutes before going to the detailing of skill development as we perceive. Now, the policy, as I said, responds to changes. And two or three changes that you must understand. What is education all about? Education is about knowledge. Education is about learning. These are the two major components that constitute an education system. It is a transmission or the generation of knowledge. And it is a learning process that is happening where the primary three primary stakeholders in this are the teachers, whether they're school teachers or college teachers or university teachers the students across any level and educational institutions, be they colleges or schools or universities. These are the three primary stakeholders. The other stakeholders that come into the picture are, of course, industry is there, parents are there, civil society is there. That's all the, they are not the immediate stakeholders coming into the picture. These are the immediate stakeholders because students are a part of an education process. Teachers are the ones who train the students or who educate the students. And all this is happening in an ecosystem, which is called a school or a college or a university. Now, when we say that this policy is responding to certain changes, we must understand that that change is for benefiting these primary stakeholders. And what are those changes? As I said, the two critical components of an education is knowledge and learning. And knowledge in the 21st century has been completely changed from knowledge as we perceived in the 20th century. Now, when you hear 20th and 21st, because we have lived through both these centuries, it will appear as if it was long time ago, but it is not long time ago. We all know that because we are born in the 20th century and we are living through the 21st century. Whereas the students are largely those who were born only in this century, at least all the students coming to you are students who would have been born after 2001. And after 2001, in the 21st century, the concept or the understanding of knowledge is very different from the concept or the understanding of knowledge that we had when we were students. And what is that distinction? That distinction arises that at our times, a knowledge in a certain discipline 
existed to the exclusion of other disciplines. That is, if I'm learning physics, it excludes chemistry, it excludes literature, it excludes sociology. It was seen as intrinsically only physics. And that notion changed. And that notion changed because we started understanding that knowledge is more integrative by nature and that it does not exclude, but it integrates a number of disciplines. This led to the new ideas of multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary, cross disciplinary. These terminologies are more prominent because the character of knowledge in the 21st century, unlike the character of knowledge in the 20th century, where we believed that knowledge existed to the exclusion of other disciplines. Knowledge of a discipline is sacrosanct and it does not integrate with other disciplines. That, it, it, that concept changed and that knowledge is actually a porous thing. It is porous and therefore other disciplines interact, get interconnected and therefore that realization that knowledge is porous led to the integration of knowledge and therefore the ideas of multidisciplinarity. So this itself is something that an education system must respond to. It cannot continue to offer education like what Professor Ansari, when reading my brief bio, was saying that I am a master's in political science, my PhD is in education, my degree is in law and so on. That was at that time seen as very, very critical because disciplinary depth was the only thing that we saw. But what has happened is when you say it is integrative, it has two aspects. It is not only the depth of a discipline, it is also a breadth. And that breadth is not to include just your own discipline or a single discipline, but multiple disciplines. And that is what is today in the 21st century, what we are saying that a graduate of 21st century, unlike a graduate of the 20th century, we are all I-shaped graduates, where we only have disciplinary depth. But today's graduate is expected to be a T-shaped graduate, where there is an upper bar, that T, which is calling for multiple disciplinary exposure, multiple skill sets, multiple competencies, and multiple capabilities. This notion that knowledge is multidisciplinary is something that this policy is seeking to understand and recommend accordingly the three-year, four-year undergraduate program, which is multidisciplinary, for which you must have had a session. I'll come back to that notion because embedding skills is a part of that notion. Now, learning also in the 21st century, unlike what it was in the 20th century, where just like knowledge, where we thought knowledge was unidimensional, we also thought learning was unidimensional in the 20th century, whereas learning in the 21st century is also seen as multidimensional. And when you look at learning in the 21st century, there is actual literature and actual studies which look at the four pillars of learning in the 21st century. That is to say that the normal understanding of those who are teachers of education, we talk about the three taxonomies of the cognitive, the affective, and the psychomotor. Whereas when you talk about learning in the 21st century and the pillars of learning, the cognitive is what we are largely doing in our classrooms where it is the first pillar of learning, the learning to know, which is transmitting knowledge that resides in me as a teacher, in each one of us as teachers, which is theoretical, which is conceptual, which is theory-based and so on. And that knowledge we are transmitting on to our learners. And that is the learning to know, which is largely the cognitive part of it. The second pillar of learner and which is the focus of today's team, is learning to do, which is what normally we talk, the psychomotor domain, the application of theory to real life situations, 
if you are studying a subject like physics, the practicals that come, and what we are telling in the 21st century, the experiential part, the skills part of it. So it is not just the theory, but also the practicals, also the experiential, also the uh, skills that is important. And it is not just the cognitive alone. The third pillar of learning is what comes because of sustainable development. We are all. Uh, as a nation committed to developmental goals, which are called the global developmental goals, as being in a committee of nations where we proclaim to achieve certain desired enshrined goals so that the world community can have a better quality of life. And the SDG goals call for the third pillar of learning, which is learning to live together and to live with others. So the third pillar of learning is a cause, is a call for compassion, tolerance, acceptance of diversity, plurality, and moving to accept people as they are, which moves towards two or three new areas, global citizenship education, peace education, education for sustainable development. And it is calling for a kind of a cooperation and coexistence, not only between human beings, but between human beings and other forms of nature, the environment, the climate, the forest, water resources, energy resources. So the whole idea of the people and the planet coming together in rich partnerships so that we are able to protect planet Earth and allow future generations to inherit it just as we inherited it from our forefathers. And therefore, the third pillar of learning is a call towards sustainable societies and peace-driven societies. And the last pillar of learning is learning to be. Learning to be is the acceptance and the recognition, more than the acceptance, first the recognition that we are about 33 people in this virtual room that each one of us is quite unique in terms of our capabilities, potentials, talents, aspirations, and so on. So if each one of us is different, an education system must not be structured, but must be flexible. And therefore, the NEP 2020 recognizes the need for individualization and customization of learning experiences and makes out a very strong case for flexible pathways in curricular choices, in pedagogical approaches, in assessment patterns, in medium of instruction, and so on. So the four pillars of learning, the learning to know, learning to do, learning to live together and to live with others, and learning to be, are all amalgamated and are they are all integrated. One is not to the exclusion of the other. And therefore, they complement each other and must be seen as a holistic process. So the multidimensionality of knowledge, the multidimensionality of learning, these two forced us as policymakers to look at creating such recommendations or making such recommendations to which our students, teachers, and educational institutions must respond. The third driver of change is the onset or the advent of disruptive technologies. So while we had the computers and the internet in the last decade of the previous century, which put data and information on a super highway with high speed to reach across synchronously, across distances that we could not even envisage, you see a new dimension, which is a challenge and an opportunity, which is the rising of the disruptive technologies like artificial intelligence and machine learning and robotics and so on. So here, three drivers, the multidimensionality of knowledge, the multidimensionality of learning, and the rise of disruptive technologies have all to be taken into account because ultimately, the main stakeholder, that is the student, 
has to be empowered for what? Has to be empowered with the right kind of knowledge, skills, competencies, and capabilities that make them productive individuals. It is very important that our students are productive individuals, are educated, are trained, are skilled, and made capable and competent to become productive individuals, contributing to their individual growth and contributing to their economic development, contributing to the societal development, contributing to the national growth and development, and becoming what we call as 21st century global citizens. That is the primary objective of any education system. And we as teachers are the catalyst for that growth, where we take into account the changes and the drivers of changes. And within those drivers of changes, how do we convert our students to have the right kind of skill sets and competencies? And all this happens within the ecosystem of our education system. So the NEP 2020 is not just a reformative document. It is not just a reform. It is a transformative document. It's transformative because when you transform something, you are not making just tinkering changes. You are not making minor changes. You are restructuring the entire system. You are looking at entire structural changes, process-related changes, and completely overhauling an existing system of education to achieve these kind of goals. As I said, that you have to be a T-shaped graduate. You have to look at the threat of disruptive technologies. And in this context, you must understand the need for holistic and multidisciplinary education. And when you look at holistic and multidisciplinary education, you must understand the importance of skills and skill education within that. So as far as NEP is concerned, when we looked at, and you must have all read through that 66-page document, and if you have the inclination, you must read through the 484-page document, which is our committee's report, which will give you more rationale and understanding and more detailing of the way in which we need to look at changes within education. Now, when you look at this recommendations in the policy, we have took at the entire sector right from preschool education up to the entire secondary stage in the new restructured school curriculum of the 5 plus 3 plus 3 plus 4, which is not a physical restructuring, but a curricular restructuring, a change in the approach to curricula and pedagogy, which is saying that learning happens in an age appropriate, developmentally driven growth that happens with the brain development and with the, the the organic development that the child undergoes so foundational stage the preparatory stage the middle stage and the secondary stage this has been accompanied with the curricular framework which is for the foundational stage which is for the entire school education and based on this the teacher education will undergo changes so there were four new curricula that we have talked about three are Two have already been released. One is in the making, and the fourth one is also likely to be brought out soon. Now, <clears throat> this and seeing the verticals, for us, it did not really matter whether it was school education or higher education, because as far as learning, it is one single trajectory. You must understand that. For administrative functionalities, you may have a school department, you may have a higher education department. But as far as a student's educational journey is concerned, it is one single organic continuum. And therefore, there are connections and interconnectedness between subsectors of education. So it is one seamless document, which is based on certain fundamental principles, which we have articulated in the very first chapter, while we have, prof we have a sort of given five major goals of access, equity, quality, affordability, and accountability, 22 cardinal principles, which ensures the consistency in the recommendations of this policy is very, very equally important for us to understand. So if even if you have read through the policy, I will re-ask each one of you to revisit that document, even though 
we are, uh, while we are talking in the month of April 2024, it is good three and a half years since the policy was approved. As on 29th of July, another three months down the line, it is four years since the policy is approved. And here we are still sitting with sensitization and orientation, which means a lot of time has already gone by in our trying to understand and grapple with the nitty gritty of understanding the policy, which still seems like an elephant in the room. And that is where we as faculty have to be proactive. Now, coming to the aspect of skill development. So in this policy, we looked at school education, higher education. Within higher education, we looked at technical education, which in management education, uh, agriculture education, legal education, medical education, all that has been taken into account. Teacher education has come up for major reforms, vocational education, open and distance learning, adult education, cross-cutting themes of technology in education, language in education, and a whole lot of reforms relating to governance and regulation. Now, our theme of skill development, what has really happened <coughs> is from a very long time. And one reason why India is not able to have uh, or grapple with the issues of uh, educated unemployed is because of our low emphasis on skills as an integral part of higher education. So right in school education also, and in higher education, <clears throat> a number of recommendations relate to embedding skills as part of education. And this notion that skill set education is only electrical electrician's work or plumbing work and gardening work and some sort of very undervalued skills has completely changed world over. And a future trend in higher education is micro credentials. So we don't want long degrees of long duration. And I say long degrees, I mean where the duration of a program is three years and four years. That is not what the trend is now. The trend is more towards micro-credentials. Why it happens is because you are in a time where the job profiles have completely changed. So when I told you about the aspect of disruptive technologies, please understand disruptive technologies is machine intelligence playing over human intelligence. But machine intelligence can never become uppermost to human intelligence. So whether you use robotics, whether you use data science, whether you use um, uh, AI like chat GPT, machine intelligence should remain subservient to human intelligence. But what is happening is that the kind of jobs that conventionally used to be done by human beings are likely to be taken away by these disruptive technologies. And that is where new set of skill sets will have to be learned. So when you look at the skill education, there are two or three things that you must understand. And I, I would like to categorize it in that manner. One is that it is no longer the conventional notion that skill education is insignificant, that it is secondary to mainstream education. Why? Because when I said knowledge is multidisciplinary, and when I said that there is a T-shaped graduate, you require skills with knowledge. And nothing remains at a lower hierarchy or a higher hierarchy. All are at par. So skills and education are to seen as to be complementary to one another, and not one becoming more important than the other. That happens only when you're talking about knowledge generation and research, not in knowledge dissemination. So the function of teaching, as we understand, and undergraduate degrees or even PG degrees, when you come to doctoral and postdoctoral, you can think of it differently. But when you largely focus on undergraduate, skills and education go hand in hand together, and they need to be seen as being combined for a holistic development. The second is the traditional idea that skills means learning 
very low order skills like becoming an electric electrician or becoming a plumber and i'm not saying that with a with any sense of prejudice because a electrician's role or a plumber's role or a mason's role is as important as maybe any other profession so while you may call it a blue collared job and the supervisor is a white collared job the notion that that is less significant is not to be seen but what i am trying to tell you is that the kind of vocations that we are talking about and vocational education that we are talking about is seeing a complete transformation thanks to changes that have happened because of technology in the medium micro and uh, the micro medium and small enterprises the fast moving consumer goods the whole idea of service sector it sector these changes hospital sector hotel sector tourism sector agri business sector has resulted in very high end levels of vocationalization and you are looking at a completely new set of courses that look at cold chain management blockchain management logistics management retail management hospitality management and so many new areas that we are looking at and these are the kind of sc skills that we need to look at the third dimension that i am trying to understand is that unlike regular faculty like us who teach conventional disciplines of physics or chemistry or sociology and so on the whole sector of skill education requires a lot of industry connect and a lot of internships and apprenticeships and the faculty should necessarily be people not who are having a phd in plumbing but necessarily people who have worked in the industry and therefore the industry linkages for skill based education becomes very important now you may say that in rural areas this may be a major lacune but here is where we are trying to say that even in rural areas we may try to identify courses that may be region specific to that area say i am right now sitting in kerala and kerala of course has its own share of industrialization no doubt but kerala is one place which has a lot of importance on fisheries and therefore the entire fisheries sector needs a lot for aquaculture and all that those are the kinds of local skills that may be required so whatever is region specific and here you may not get big players in industry but you will get actual people who run such kind of activities and who have been successful entrepreneurs in that area they are the ones who need to be coming in as, and doubling up as faculty or taking on teachers and they may not be regular appointment so these three buckets in relation to skill development let me first try to take up skill development as we envisaged within the idea of the four year undergraduate program on which i understand you must have already had your session so when you looked at the flexible three year four year undergraduate program we talked of six categories of courses we are talking about common courses core courses interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary or what you generally understand as elective courses ability enhancement courses which are your language courses your skill enhancement courses and your value added courses this is the six categories of courses now even in the common courses we are talking of certain skills problem solving skills digital skills they are um, collaborative skills these are also skills please understand so when you are conventionally thinking in terms of skill development don't just think in terms of such skills that are there relevant for an industry alone but certain skills that students must be sort of equipped with because you are talking about having what we call the 21st century skills of communication collaboration and so on so problem solving skills analytical skills these are all what we call are the higher order thinking skills so the concept of learning where 
we were learning by testing memory has to go to test competencies. And that means that in terms of skill development, as a faculty, my own skills of teaching has to also change in the sense that I use innovative pedagogies where I involve the students through activities such as asking them to make a presentation, using a flipped classroom mode, providing for a group discussion, giving them a field work, giving them some studio work, giving them some small project, we are asking them to do some role play. These are all the things that we need to do in order to ensure that our students have what we call are those multiple skills that are necessary in the global 21st century skilling requirements. How do I do a project in a collaborative manner? Please understand today, collaboration is the key to any success in any venture. And our students, when they go out and have to face the world of work, they will be completely at a loss if they have not been taught collaborative skills. So if you give them group discussions, you put them into activities where they work together as a team, someone who is good at presenting comes up, someone who is good at organizing the thoughts come up, someone who is good at actually the resource management comes up, they all come together to achieve a common goal. This kind of things are sort of to be taught in your common courses. And mind you, for your common courses, except for such courses which have year-marked credits, there are no separate periods or lectures year-marked. You have to weave into your topic as you teach the subject. If I'm teaching English literature, or I teach physics, or I teach mechanical engineering, or I teach commerce, or I teach sociology, in that subject that I teach, I should be able to sort of inculcate analytical skills, problem solving skills, collaborative skills, digital skills in my students by using a variety of activities. Now, this is as far as your common courses. Now, when it comes to your core courses and your interdisciplinary courses, since the existing BWOC program, and I don't know how many of you are coming in from that stream, the existing BWOC program also is becoming multidisciplinary. So even if you're taking up a specialized course in merchandising or in retail management or in supply chain management, you will still have to learn other subjects. So therefore, your core and elective courses or your core and interdisciplinary also will become holistic. But coming to your specific ability enhancement is all your English language uh, and your communicative uh, uh, skills that can come up not only in English, but in other languages. But skill enhancement and value added. These two courses are basically being highly neglected as a part of the four-year undergraduate program. That is mainly because conventionally in our undergraduate program, we have not thought about the students doing some credit courses. It can be four credits, eight credits, or 16 credits, whatever, in skill-based courses. And now all students, and mind you, let me also relate this as a part of our school curriculum also, we are talking in terms of skill-based courses. And in the new national curriculum framework of 2023, all students would have to learn vocational courses, which is mandatory in classes 9, 10, 11, and 12. So they cannot run away from it because it is a necessity as a part of responding to the technological challenges where job profiles are completely changing. So having knowledge of how to use AI, how to use disruptive technologies in logistics management, in supply chain management, in cold chain management, in retail management, in hospital management, in tourism sector, in agribusiness sector, in aquaculture sector, in many, many high-end areas of digital uh, technologies, in terms of using of AI for many other functions, media and journalism, in all these sectors. Have a look at the AICTs, uh, and you will say, ah, why should I look at AICT? I'm not an engineering. Don't see say it like that. There is no segregation. 99 courses that have been listed, which are the future skills that will be required by our students. 
if you are there as a teacher to empower your student not to be an unemployed student to graduate tomorrow you must have a look at these courses now you may say i am not the decision maker but as a faculty you have a right to go back and inform your institution that these are the kind of courses that we should offer but as i said it is not one size fits all each institution depending on the availability of the resources should be able to do that but skill enhancement and value added most of the institutions are treating it in a fungible manner that being said aside the fact remains that for skill enhancement we must be able to introduce industry relevant skill based courses you are not the faculty to teach that you need to get in people from the industry to do that but in your own sector you must be able to identify which are those new skill sets that are being required say you are teaching political science as a subject and you need to understand a lot that goes in election surveys and how digital skills are being used to make projections this is something that they should learn and if you are a student or you are a faculty of let us say english literature and you are finding that today poetry can be done by chat gpt if i give two or three keywords the chat gpt will throw up a poem how do i tackle creativity with that kind of skill so in all areas where we are as teachers needing to also become proactive in learning these new things in terms of the new skill sets that are required digital marketing the new kind of media that how do you see today the media of, uh, persons functioning they are all standing there with a mobile in their hand and they are all getting their updates that would require them to use multiple platforms on a mobile handset not just using it for entertainment but for information and for infotainment so the kind of skills that are needed for that kind of that kind of jobs that are being seen so journalism or media studies or film making or um, uh, mechanical engineering or civil engineering or chemistry or physics all these things today are completely in a very digitalized environment and we need to understand what are those digital courses what are those skills courses that our students need to learn so that when they go out they are not only having the core discipline or the multidisciplinary area but they also have some skill based courses on which they can rely why this is becoming important is that if you generally here we are seeing that there is two common adages that the job profiles are changing so fast that earlier we used to say every 7 years but now it would be almost every 7 months that is the speed with which the obsolescence of a skill set is becoming a reality the second is the fact that we do not know what the future job roles look like so in that situation of uncertainty unlike our times of our comfort zones they are actually having a lot of unknown challenges that are there so they do the one skill set that they may have learned may be the kind of job that they may be able to get and that is why the multidisciplinarity weaves in the skill based course the second angle that we have tried to do is in terms of the internships and the apprenticeships so all undergraduate students we now make it mandatory that we must have all students going in for internships like projects and so on now these internships were intended because when you have the industry telling you that your 60% of your graduates are unemployable not unemployed unemployable they do not have the employability skills at all is something that is highly critical and it is not speaking about somebody else it is speaking about me and you as faculty that we have brought out graduates who are not worth the salt that they are now that is something that we wanted to combat and largely we saw that students studying in colleges and universities were completely at a loss when they go out to try for jobs they don't have the the soft skills they don't have the communication skills they are not having the collaborative skills 
they are not able to identify a problem, analyze that problem, and find out solutions to that problem. And that is what is required. So when you do internships, you give them a whole set of skills that make them sort of competent or have capabilities that will make them fit into a world of work. So here is a new set of skills. And here is something where all of us are actually to be re-looking at and understanding what are those kind of projects that we can ask our students to take up. Now, this kind of projects where we are conventionally thinking that internship is with industry or corporate, that is not the case because what we are saying is internships can be with a research student who is doing some study or with a PG department or with a retired educationist or with a retired industrialist. We have said, uh, go through the UGC guidelines, which have been recently brought out for internships. And I'm not talking about the research internships. I'm talking about the regular internship projects of two to four credits that all undergraduate students have to do. See the kind of variety of courses that we can. Ultimately, it is also a community engagement and a community connect because you're trying to make students understand problems that people face on the ground within the communities that they live. It may be problems related to transportation. It may be problems related to uh, uh, employment program. Some um, uh, It may be related to core sectors of power supply, of uh, roads, of lack of drinking water, of lack of sanitation. Any of these areas can be areas in which students can take up internships. So here is where we need to also get ourselves equipped to understand that this is requiring a student to go through a certain protocol of undertaking a study and arriving at certain findings or arriving at certain solutions, depending upon the problem that has been identified. Now, coming to the third dimension, and that is the whole idea of skill education in its entire framework. Now, you know that the instrumentalities that we created is the National Higher Education Qualification Framework, which allows for the mobility of students across institutions, across modes of learning, and across the whole idea of flexibility that we are providing with multiple entry and exit. But along with that, we also got the national credit framework, which embeds the lateral entry from vocational education, from ITIs, from polytechnics into mainstream education. Now, this whole idea of reimagining vocational education, we created in the policy we wrote about the creation of a national committee for integrating vocational education, which has now come out as the National Council for Vocational Education and Training, which has been a part of all these guidelines that UGC brought out for the four-year undergraduate program and so on. These are all a part of those. They were all a part of it. The NCVT was a part of that entire integration process, particularly in terms of internships, in terms of putting up skill enhancement courses. They had a lot of ideas. And the entire national credit framework, which is talking about the different levels and the weightages that we give, has been basically the work of the NCVET. Now here, the importance of understanding what are those skills, qualifications that are required, come out through what we call the sector skill councils. Every industry has a sector skill council, which identifies what are the skill sets or the new skill qualifications that are needed. These are then matched with what we call are the national occupational standards. So for a certain skill, what is those national occupational standards? These are mapped together. Now, I, I am not asking that you have to do it. I'm only enlightening you about the whole process that goes into skill education. Now, over here, when you have the sector skill councils, and the national occupational standards, you then also have benchmarks in terms of standards, minimum standards, the minimum competencies that needs to be acquired by a student. So the sector skill councils and the national occupational standards take this together. Then they determine the levels at which students can come in. And here is where a very important thing that we have done is the recognition of prior learning. 
Now, many a times, many of the rudimentary skills are skills, let us say a motor mechanic for that matter. They may not have acquired a certification, but they are having skills because traditionally they have sort of learned it hands down from their parents and so on. Many of the artisan skills, many of the craftsmen skills, these are all skills that are traditionally handed over, but there is no formal certification. Now, these people, if they want to come into mainstream, rather than being confined to that level itself, we have talked about recognition of prior learning, where if they clear a particular exam, which is in terms of not necessarily theoretical exams, but a hands-on exam kind of a thing, they are given a certificate which is equating them to 8th standard or 10th standard or plus 2 level and so on. That then allows them with that certificate to then join the mainstream education. So the whole skills qualification framework and the NHEQF, which were earlier seen as separate, have now been merged together where skills and higher education come hand in hand together and credits, weightages that the students acquire have come in through one single framework that we call is the national credit framework. And all this is, of course, digitally stored in the academic bank of credit. Now, from the institution's point of view, the importance is to network with industries. Now, one of the best models, I'm not saying that for any publicity, but one of the best models for vocational education and skill-based education is the Tata Institute of Social Sciences. They have networked with almost 140 industry partners in various sector skills and offer these courses to their students. The industry provides the hands-on training and the students are completing their internships there and 100% placement is provided for those students. Now, as part of our undergraduate program, when we offer skill-based courses or skill enhancement courses, though the thrust is quite limited, even if we don't go to a TIS model of 140 industry partners, at least having some 8 to 10 industry partners will make a lot of difference in, in terms of the skill sets that the students will acquire. Now, this is something which will require a lot of scouting around and understanding which are the industries in that region and understanding what is the needs, the regional specific needs or the local needs, which are contextualized to each locality and lo local areas that we need to understand. So say, for example, the entire Northeast, even when I was in the planning commission way back in 2006, we have talked about the Northeast being one of the very critical uh, sectors contributing to the airline industry, contributing to the hotel industry and to the tourism sector. Now, therefore, courses over there should be focusing on th those areas. Then comes their whole set in terms of dairy farming, in terms of agri-based businesses and uh, floriculture and so on. So every area, and please understand, if you are looking at the kind of job opportunities, these are some of the new, new job opportunities that our students can take advantage of. And we sh should not say, no, no, I'm teaching sociology. What have I got to do with skill enhancement? Or I'm teaching uh, English literature. What have I got to do with that? Please understand that all our sectors lend themselves to new kinds of skill sets that students need. And the policy has given you an enabler for you to explore and understand which are those new skill sets, scout for that information, scout in your local area, bring about this kind of a linkage with the local entrepreneurs, with the local craftsmen, many of these things. See, in school education, just for your information, between classes six to eight, we have recommended 10 days bagless. That 10 days bagless is for students to intern with local craftsmen. India is a country which is known for its artisanry, for its craftsmanship and so on. Unfortunately, our children do not even connect to that because we are sitting there with this highly, um, I would say, elitist notions 
of sending them to public schools and making them English oriented and so on, without understanding that the heart of India lies in its people and its rural sectors and in the agriculture sector. So even in the agriculture sector, there are so many skill courses that are required. But we somehow feel so the 10 days bagless was more in terms of bringing about a connect with the local community and with the local craftsmen and completely removing any books and actually going out and interning with them. That same notion in higher education takes and manifests itself with the skill enhancement courses. So we as faculty need to identify that just as someone was asking me in the beginning itself about reading lit textbooks it is not knowledge does not come only from textbooks it is to be understood by relating to people and you know trades and um, jobs that have come about in the society and mind you the kind of jobs that we are looking at are completely changed we are not looking at see today if you are looking at a person who is selling uh, who is buying old newspapers the typical person who is to scream in front of housing societies that he or she is taking old newspapers that sector itself has got so technologically advanced all those notions that we are conventionally we have used during our times have completely changed the whole business of you know aggregators like uber for the travel industry of zomato and swiggy who come in for the uh, the food sector the whole idea of using technology and the entire banking sector which has changed all this is because of technology can we then afford to simply sit with an old outdated idea of learning just theoretical knowledge and not giving our students the kind of multiple skill sets and the competencies so let us firstly understand that skills let us not make the statement that skills is not my business if you are a faculty with a career of another 20 years in advance, then you must be re-looking at your role as a faculty in trying to integrate skills within education. And it doesn't matter what discipline you teach, you have, a, have to have a very active role. But none of these faculty who come in from industry, who come in from the sector, from their own industry sectors, they do not come in as regular faculty. They all come in as contract faculty, but you must also collaborate with them because then you will understand the kind of skills that help in your own discipline and that network is created for greater collaboration. So I would look at, I would sort of urge each one of you, when you look at the topic of skill development, you are actually having a very great felt need to not just empower students with knowledge and you know just theoretical knowledge but also a number of skills and that in the four year undergraduate program uh, is already listed under common courses is there under the skill enhancement is there under the value added is included as part of the internships and there is a great need for a thrust to look at the new and emerging areas in which we need to empower our students with new certification courses so you can even try that as a step forward in my discipline what are the new short-term certification courses that my college or my university can offer you bring up a tie-up with another industry and understand that this is a new need and come out with say say for example in commerce digital marketing it can be a three months course and as i said the future trend of education is micro credentials and this would be an additional qualification that your students have so many of the state governments have skill acquisition programs which are all micro certifications of three months and six months and so on so think of those areas where you can think of embedding skills ensuring that skills and higher education go hand in hand together how does skills also the last point i seem to have forgotten is moving for entrepreneurial skills so when we are looking at the undergraduate education you are often hearing this statement that we need not create job seekers but we can have job creators job creators can come only if students have been trained with entrepreneurial skills 
you must give them abilities by which they can become entrepreneurs and startups so you have your in your institution to create incubation centers where if students have ideas from ideation to conceptualization to productization and marketization a chain is created and that is incubated through the incubation centers so skills at a higher level is looking at entrepreneurial skills setting up new enterprises setting up innovative startups and so on which can create more jobs and that students need not really conventionally try for jobs and most of the success stories that you are seeing in the world over are basically those successful entrepreneurs who came out with an idea and which has become a success story so let us now relook at skill based education completely from a different angle and don't start thinking no no that's a blue colored job that is an electrician's job that's a mason's job that's a plumber's job we as part of the science technology and innovation policy which i was a part of i was fortunate to be part from the education vertical we clearly said that the science and technology departments have to provide funding for high end laboratories for high end uh, um, uh, equipments so that the skill based education can be taken to a different level you are talking about 3d printing machine printing and so on all these require high end equipment that may not get funded by the ministry of education but the science and technology departments have a lot of funding that can be provided for ensuring this kind of uh, you know infrastructural inputs in terms of equipments and laboratories can be provided so the whole idea of skill development has completely been revolutionized because of the times in which we are living and as a sector of education we cannot remain silent spectators we have to jump into it and participate in that and we as faculty have to firstly be convinced about the importance of this factor in education and do whatever we can contribute through the variety of ideas that i have just shared with you into ensuring that as part of holistic development students also are given adequate skills and competencies which is necessary in a this world of disruptive technologies let me stop over here and keep the remaining 15 minutes for interaction yeah sudeep has raised a hand i think professor ansari may be still around he can coordinate or moderate moderate that but i would request sudeep to please go ahead and ask your question Anyone else please go ahead hello please go ahead hey ma'am sarendra sir kuch keh raha hai sarendra sir Sudeep Mandal has raised and Sudeep Mandal sir no sir no mr sir thanks ma'am aapne kafi applied cheeze batayi wo sari cheeze hum logon ke liye upyogi hai 
तो हमारा वाकई ओरिएंटेशन हुआ आपने जो कई चीजें बताई उन छोटी छोटी चीजों पर हमारा ध्यान नहीं जाता तो वो सारी यूजफुल चीजें हैं तो हमारे लिए डेफिनेटली वो काम आएगी हमारे एकेडमिक करियर में और हमारी रिस्पॉन्सिबिलिटीज को फुलफिल करने के लिए वो काफी हेल्पफुल होंगी तो थैंक्स थैंक यू शैलेंद्र जी आप कहाँ सिखाते हैं और क्या सिखाते हैं नमस्कार मैं मैं शैलेंद्र खंडेलवाल हूँ एसोसिएट प्रोफेसर हूँ कुशाभा ठाकरे पत्रकारिता एवं जन संचार विश्वविद्यालय मैम हम ये एक मीडिया यूनिवर्सिटी है देश में केवल तीन जर्नलिज्म की यूनिवर्सिटी है एक माखनलाल चतुर्थी यूनिवर्सिटी भोपाल और दूसरे हम हैं रायपुर में और तीसरा जयपुर में है पंडित हरिदेव जोशी विश्वविद्यालय तो बेसिकली हमारे यहाँ मीडिया से रिलेटेड कोर्सेज होते हैं तो मैं उसमें एडवर्टाइजिंग एंड पब्लिक रिलेशन डिपार्टमेंट में एसोसिएट प्रोफेसर हूँ यहाँ ये दोनों सेक्टर में काफी सारे स्किल बेस्ड कोर्सेस ऑफर कर सकते हैं आपकी तरफ से तो ऑफर किए ही जाते हैं शायद वो डिग्री प्रोग्राम्स होंगे बट शॉर्ट टर्म कोर्सेस के भी आप कोशिश कीजिए क्योंकि सो दैट स्टूडेंट्स प्लस टू का पास करने के बाद अगर वो फर्स्ट ईयर क्योंकि हम मल्टीपल एंट्री और एक्सिट की ऑप्शन दिया है उनको और अगर वो फर्स्ट ईयर या सेकेंड ईयर करने के बाद एक शॉर्ट टर्म कोर्स आपका किया है और उसको कुछ ऑन द जॉब ट्रेनिंग जैसे मिलके वो जॉब भी कर सकते हैं तो वो एक एडिशनल बेनिफिट मिल सकती है बिकॉज ही कैन कम बैक और शी कैन कम बैक एंड कंप्लीट द कोर्स इन रिमेनिंग थ्री और फोर इयर्स आफ्टर अ ब्रेक सो दैट एक्सपीरियंस प्लस एजुकेशन जो कॉम्बिनेशन होती है दैट हेल्प्स देम इन देयर फ्यूचर बिकॉज वो जो थ्री ईयर्स एंड फोर ईयर उनको कम्प्लीट करना है वो बहुत आसानी से कम्प्लीट करेंगे सो दैट इज टू बी एंकरेज बिकॉज योर्स इज अ वेरी यू नो निश एरिया for uh, journalism and media studies advertising and all that they have all completely transformed because uh, aajkal jo channels hai they are not necessarily the channels that we watch conventionally but a lot of channels which are available in the digital uh, platforms so there also the whole kind of publicity and advertising and also looking at all these new threats of fake videos and all that how those can all be combated these are all some new areas that you can offer short term courses yes ma'am yes uh, thank you ma'am thanks for encouraging me aur uh, main invite kar raha hu ma'am kabhi bhi raipur agar aapka idhar aana ho to aap hamare institution mein aapka swagat hai raipur se related hum log ke like koi bhi kaam ho to bataiye as well as ma'am main sare jo uh, respective participants hain unko bhi invite kar raha hu ki agar kabhi wo raipur ki taraf visit kare to hamara institution ki taraf se unka swagat hoga karke thank, thank you, you thank you shailen thank you ji no participant any more questions and query from ma'am regarding this topic or topic ma'am mera ek observation hai ho sakta hai ye bahut hi naive ho aur isko shayad actually matlab realize ha ha ma'am main ye keh rahi thi ki when we pass our graduation and post graduation uh, jo mostly jo girls hoti hai ma'am uh, we are we are getting married aur uske baad pe ma'am bacche hote hain तो मैम वो जो बच्चों को संभालना होता है वो जो प्रिलिमिनरी मतलब हाउ टू होल्ड द बेबी हाउ टू चेंज द रैपर वो ऐसा लगता है कि मैम सारी जो पढ़ाई है वो मतलब कुछ ऐसा लगता है कि उसका तो कोई यूज यहाँ तो नहीं हो रहा है बट दैट इज वेरी बेसिक फॉर द ह्यूमन काइंड एट लार्ज तो मैम ऐसा कुछ uh, मतलब हो सकता है कि मैं बहुत ही सरियल uh, uh, सोच रही हूँ मतलब ऐसा कुछ क्यों नहीं हो सकता हमारे एजुकेशन सिस्टम में सेल्फ की जो uh, मतलब uh, जो दोनों जेंडर अभी तो जेंडर का खैर एक बहुत ही फ्लूड कॉन्सेप्ट हो गया है जो कि मतलब अपार्ट फ्रॉम मेल एंड फीमेल मतलब जितने भी लोग हैं लर्नर्स हैं प्रॉपर उनको मतलब कुछ प्रिलिमिनरी इन्फॉर्मेशन मैम इसकी भी हो क्योंकि मैम बहुत ही हेल्पलेस महसूस करते हैं उस टाइम पे हम हमारी जो पूरी सारी नॉलेज हमने जो पढ़ी है वो उस समय यूज नहीं हो रही होती है मैम और मतलब मैं ये नहीं कह रही हूँ कि हम अपना पॉलिटिकल साइंस क्या है या इंग्लिश क्या है तो वो यूज करेंगे एट दैट टाइम इट इज नॉट इट इज यूजलेस टू स्टेट सच काइंड ऑफ थिंग्स बट मैम कुछ तो ऐसा प्रिलिमिनरी होना चाहिए क्योंकि उस समय मैम कुछ समझ में ही नहीं आता है कि मतलब कैसे क्या करें और मतलब मैम शायद कह नहीं पा रही हूँ मैम आई एम नॉट गेटिंग द राइट वर्ड हेयर बट यू मे अंडरस्टैंड आई थिंक एज फॉर एज बिंग अबाउट certain kind of uh, these are all life skills that we learn only when we experience it these are not uh, these are not uh, kind of standard uh, protocols uh, that we have of course in the western world there are a lot of such uh, classes given to uh, expectant mothers and i think even here in urban areas a lot of yes, such classes are fair. held for expectant mothers to handle this and not just expectant mothers both the parents are expected to attend 
because as you said it is no longer gender specific uh, looking after a newborn baby is as much a responsibility of the uh, new father as much as the new mother and therefore these uh, uh, classes are normally held wherever the hospitals where the parent is going uh, the mother is going to deliver usually or there may be ngos who sort of support such hospitals to provide such kind of uh, basic classes but more than anything else it is the emotional strengthening and the emotional intelligence and the emotional strength that comes so in our education one of the ways that we are looking at uh, how to handle stress which comes is a question of handling emotional intelligence and emotional well being so not uh, say in terms of suddenly we have to face a legal case or we are suddenly looking at a kind of a financial problem these are all things that add stress and how do we handle that that is why in the policy we said that we must have a whole sector on health and well being and health and wellness and what kind of nutrition uh, young mothers have to take what kind of food newborn babies have to be given all this so actually to be very frank when we were inviting suggestions all the ministries wrote for every field they wanted like how to cross the road how do you develop road sense in people so the ministry of road transport wrote to us that we should have short term courses for children to understand basic road signs and how they should you you know look at traffic signals how they should cross the road how they should make the elderly cross the road then whole lot of people coming from agriculture who told us that indians are basically living in villages and the children seem to be not even understanding i jokingly tell if you ask a friend's grandson of mine in bombay where does the apple come he will say it is coming from reliance fresh he doesn't know apple is cultivated it is grown as a seed it grows into a tree that kind of thing is not there in urban children i am only trying to tell you arpana ji that basic life skills are things that different uh, sectors but we are not of course there are women's colleges where where they are talking in terms of health and wellness they even have courses related to what you just asked about handling a newborn baby changing a diaper feeding a baby these kind of courses are being provided these are all kind of para medical courses that are provided how do you handle a small injury in the house how do you handle cpr for someone suffering a heart attack it is not that you need a doctor to learn it we all should be equipped with that it is a certain kind of life skills that we have you have just given us an example because it directly relates to you when you have become a mother how is it that we are not but as i said the more aware we have we become you have all your anganwadis which tell the rural women about uh, the whole idea about handling infants and you are quite uh, it is unfortunate that in urban areas we do not go to anganwadis because firstly we think that that is not necessary but the whole lot of rural women they all have exposure with primary health centers and anganwadi systems where these places they tell them that as soon as a child is born what are the certain basic things that need to be done and there's a whole lot of change i mean even in terms of the kind of uh, the, this may not be the right forum but even in terms of delivery of a child that it is a natural process to deliver a child and that is only in human beings that we talk about a, a kind of a cesarean section and all that otherwise it's supposed to be a very normal phenomenon that happens and in tribal societies within 2 weeks of a normal delivery a woman would be back on her feet doing all the normal course as usual it's only that the more we have become urbanized we think that this is something so external to us as a factor and therefore feel very odd about it and feel very helpless like you expressed your helplessness but these are also in urban areas these days being done as classes being given to expectant parents and as you said very rightly and i'm happy you said that that these days there is no need for gender stereotyping and whether it is cooking whether it's taking care of a child whether it's taking care of any home care home course 
it is gender neutral and both are expected to be a part of it so that is of course but you as you said this is not part of a curricula this is something in terms of a sensitization and an orientation but these may not necessarily be included as part of curricula but nevertheless there is no harm in talking about it having a discussion on it organizing a one special talk so that children come to know about it in the even in a class environment just as when we were young students we used to have special talks on sex education we used to have talks on sexual violence these are all topics that can be sensitized to the students though of course it is not part of the formal curriculum uh, ma'am uh, kindly give me permission to say a few words please please uh... देखिए अभी इन दिनों पेरेंटिंग के लिए बहुत सारे प्रोविजन हुए हैं और उनका इम्प्लीमेंटेशन चालू हो गया है जैसे मैटर्निटी लीव है वो अब प्रॉपर मिलने लगी है प्राइवेट सेक्टर में बड़ी प्रॉब्लम थी कि प्राइवेट सेक्टर में तमाम प्रोविजन के बाद भी मैटर्निटी लीव नहीं मिलती थी उसके लिए जो ई है वो बहुत अच्छी फैसिलिटीज देता है जो लोअर इनकम ग्रुप के लोग हैं उनको ई इतना सपोर्ट करता है कि मैटर्निटी लीव के दौरान वो ट्रीटमेंट का पूरा खर्च तो बच्चे जच्चे के लिए देता ही है एडिशनली वो टू मंथ्स की सैलरी भी प्रोवाइड करता है ताकि ऑर्गेनाइजर अगर उसको सपोर्ट नहीं करता हो तो स्टेट में पूरी सैलरी देता है तो ये एक बहुत बड़ा सपोर्ट है एडिशनली मैं सोसाइटी में जैसे जैसे हमारी जरूरतें बढ़ती है हम समझ विकसित करते हैं हमारे यहाँ लॉ जो बने हैं वो उन दिनों के बने हैं जब वुमेन्स वर्किंग नहीं थी और अगर करती भी तो वेरी अलाइट जॉब में थी वो ऑफिस में या एडमिनिस्ट्रेटिव या क्लरिकल जॉब में होती थी लेकिन अब टाइम चेंज हो गया है अब इंडस्ट्रीज में भी वुमेन्स है वो अपनी एफिशियंसी को प्रूफ कर रही हैं तो ऐसी चीजों के कारण जो लॉ है उसमें अमेंडमेंट चालू हो गए हैं धीरे धीरे और इसके अलावा जो हमारे मार्केट है वो भी उसमें अपना एक्टिवली पार्टिसिपेंट शो कर रहा है जैसे एक एग्जांपल कोट करना चाहूंगा जोमेटो ने ये जोमेटो की तारीफ करूंगा उसका बिजनेस मॉडल जो भी हो लेकिन उसने एक फैसिलेट किया है अपने वुमेन्स एम्प्लॉयज को कि महीने में दो दिन वो विदाउट प्रायर इंटीमेशन लीव ले सकते हैं तो उनकी मेडिकली रिक्वायरमेंट जो भी है उन अपने चुनौतियों के दौरान उनको दो दिन की छुट्टी मिल सकती है तो ये एक अच्छी शुरुआत है प्राइवेट सेक्टर में भी लोग इस तरह से आगे आ रहे हैं तो होगा और दूसरा अर्पणा मैम ने जो सवाल किया उसमें शायद एक ये था कि आपने जो पढ़ा है उसकी यूटिलिटी क्या तो सबसे बड़ी बात मैं यहाँ सबके सामने शेयर करना चाहूंगा कि जो एनईपी है वो उसका एग्जिस्टेंस इसलिए आया एनईपी की जरूरत ही इसलिए पड़ी कि अब तक हम जो पढ़ते थे वो केवल प्रिंसिपली और बाकी चीजों के लिए थे अब जो एनईपी है कहीं ना कहीं हमको स्किल्ड बनाने के डायरेक्शन में बात करता है तो हम अगर स्किल्ड है तो हमारी रिस्पॉन्सिबिलिटीज जो भी हो उनकर उन, उन सबसे हमको उभरने में मदद मिलेगी और उसकी यूटिलिटी होगी तो बल्कि मैं सबसे रिक्वेस्ट करूंगा कि हम सब लोग भी जितने जल्दी एनईपी को इस मैनर में अगर इंप्लीमेंट करें कि हम स्किल्ड बेस्ड एजुकेशन की तरफ बढ़ें तो जो एक सवाल उठाया है वो सामने है वो दूर हो जाएगा और सबके लिए वो बहुत अच्छा रहेगा तो ऐसा एक पॉइंट रेस किया जिस वजह से सबको लीगल फ्रेमवर्क इज ऑल्सो वेरी एंकरेजिंग दीज डेज that encourages uh, it's not just the public sector but also the private sector which has become very sensitive uh, to gender our topic is veering more towards women and gender but in any case uh, any other questions on skill development or anything on the nep uh, so this you had raised your hand again was it again a mistake if not please ask your question I think that was a mistake. Uh, Mazhar ji, uh, uh, Ansari ji, any other questions are there? No, no, I'm not here. Any question like? That. Okay. I think I'm uh, very, very much. Thank you, ma'am. आज का सेशन बहुत अच्छा था और आखिरी में हमारी brainstorming बहुत अच्छी हो गई. हम सोसाइटी के लिए और हमारे आधी दुनिया के लिए हम लोग रिस्पॉन्सिबल बने इस डायरेक्शन में हमारी ब्रेनस्टॉर्मिंग हुई ये अच्छी चीज है तो थैंक्स मैम आपने बहुत पेशेंसली हमारी बातों को बताया और अर्पणा मैम को भी थैंक्स कि उन्होंने एक वैलिड क्वेश्चन किया तो हम सबके दिमाग में कुछ चीजें आई मेरा एक रिक्वेस्ट अंसारी सर से है सर हमारे यहाँ जितने एक्सपर्ट्स आते हैं उनके प्रेजेंटेशन अगर पीपीटी अवेलेबल हो सके तो काइंडली वो हमारा एक रिक्वेस्ट पेंडिंग है आपके पास चुनौतियों वाले समय में 
होली पीरियड चल रहा है आपकी भी अपनी बहुत सारे रूटीन और चैलेंजेस होंगे लेकिन उन सब में आपने इतने पेशेंसली हमको टाइम दिया थैंक यू थैंक्स अलॉट सारे पार्टिसिपेंट की तरफ से थैंक यू थैंक यू मैम again thank you ma'am and thank you participant thank you thank very you, much thank you all do take care and stay blessed thank you thank you very much